Welcome back to the channel. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. This is a brand new series called 20 Questions With. I've got my very first guest, of course, actor and good friend Ricky Norwood on my first victim. I will be asking Ricky 20 questions. Some will be funny. Some will be serious. Some will be awkward. Ricky, how are you? Are you ready? Oh, mate, I don't know what I've let myself in for. To everyone listening and watching right now, I literally have no clue. Uh, what is about to happen. Chris asked me to come on for a new segment. It's going to be 20 random questions. And I was like, all right, and mate, let's do it. I've had no prep. I've got no clue what's coming. And I didn't even know it was live. But uh, let's have it. Let's have it. Let's go for it. There's trust. You must trust me by now, Rick. That's all I oh, can yeah. say. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens after this. <laughs> right, Ricky, first question for you. Um, right. Give us three interesting facts about Ricky Norwood. Oh, bloody hell. Uh, three interesting facts. Uh, um, um, I've always loved Marvel and comic books. Um, comic books was one of the first things that I, I jumped into. When I was a kid, I, I could never afford them. And it was when I got my first job um, and my first pay packet. Uh, it was the first thing that I'd done was past the same old corner shop, which I used to go past. And I used to look at them all the time and be like, mm, uh, but I just didn't have that £2.50. And I couldn't ask my mum for it either. It, 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 that two pound fifty was, uh, you know, it, it was going towards better use. So um, the, the first time I got my pay packet, I went in and I got myself a, a Wolverine and Deadpool comic. And um, yeah, that's been my love for comics ever since. Ever since I've got a pay packet, I'm always in a comic book somewhere, shape or form. And and Wolverine is is one of my favourite comic book characters um not only the claws and the action but he, he, he metaphorically he was he was kind of like a person that every time he got knocked down he got back up do you know what i mean and i just loved that concept and i loved the concept of the x-men as well the way that they kind of parodied society and 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 ways of dealing with societal problems um i kind of clocked onto that from early so there's one um what's another one um uh, my favourite film, I suppose. I'll, I'll give you a favourite film, unless that's one of the questions, and then no, I go won't on. give it to No, all right, cool. Well, one of my favourite films and film franchises, li like a lot of us, but w w was Rocky. Um, I grew up kind of seeing that somebody that was so hard and tough could still be sensitive and caring and compassionate and empathetic. And um, and I just love that character. I love the message of him. Um Another one, another character that every time he got knocked down, he got back up. Another one that 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 faced um, adversity and, and faced doubt a lot. And I love the fact that he always got up and, and kind of showed everybody that they were wrong about him. And it doesn't matter where you come from or what surroundings you're from or what society you're from or what financial background you're from, that if you have a dream and you're willing to work hard for it, then uh, you, you can you can make it and you can achieve it. So um, yeah, love the Rocky franchise. And three, um, uh, three. Uh, well, yeah, as a youngster, I suppose uh, myself and Darren Hart, who you know, um, you know, we grew up in after school acting club and going to theatre workshops and stuff like that. And when we finished college. Um, at 18, 19, after a BTEC national and a HNC, the both of us came out and both of us was ready for a job. Both of us was ready for an agent, but it doesn't fall in your lap like that. So you got, again, you got to work for it. So there, there wasn't many opportunities for us. So myself, Darren, and one other member whose name was John, uh, D-J-A-N, but you say it, John, um, we started up our own little production company and we put together our own show. We wrote it, we done the set, you know, we built it, helped build the set, helped paint it, helped light it. We, we brought in, uh, different various acts of singing, dancing and, um, poetry and, uh, magic, uh, loads of different skills. And we kind of formulated a show around them. And that was our first kind of experience of getting on stage and doing our own thing off of our own backs. And that's what got us both started, really. It was after that that we got our first agents and, and we continued to do other types of theatre jobs as well straight after that. So, um, yeah, that was something that we started when we was like 18, 19. It was called DRD Productions. 
And um, yeah, it was really successful for the three, four, maybe five years that it was going. It was sold out, successful, and it was something that nobody had seen before. And we brought a lot of our friends that were in the industry, that was in the profession, uh, friends and and people that we trusted along. And we um, gave everybody a platform as well as ourselves. And uh, then we progressed. The rest is history, I suppose. Love it, Rick. Question number two. What is it like being an actor? What was it like being on his senders for that period of time? And is it possible that Fat Boy will return to his senders in the future? Oh, all right. OK. Uh, all right. So what's it like being an actor? Um, being an actor is, is fun, but it's tough. Um, the reality of being an actor is tough. Um, you, you, you get far more no's than you do yeses, but it's about making those yeses work and trying to get the best out of those to progress you on to the next yes. Um, so when I was, when I first got into the game, it was the only thing that I really was in love with and something that I was, I was good at. I started off in street dance and from there I went to, to kind of acting and, and theatre. Never been a singer. Um, but yeah, I mean, the journey is definitely a struggle, but the highs are fantastic, you know, and, and, and I'm not talking about like financially or, or within fame, but actually doing a great piece of work, jumping in, being able to jump in anybody's shoes and being able to adapt yourself to kind of the character that you're portraying. It's, it, it can be really fun. Um, it, and it is really fun. All of the jobs that I've done have been fantastic. I've really enjoyed them. Made fantastic friends that I still speak to now. And um, yeah, I've got some great memories there. I've got some great memories. But every time you finish one, every time you come to the end of the story of, of one chapter, of one job, uh, then it's the, the climb again to go again and audition and be back in the room and go up against... 500 people all after the same job and putting your best foot forward it can be soul destroying at times as in you know when you when you don't get the job that you really want or that you feel that you should have got um but it's about how you pick yourself back up how you dust yourself off how you look at yourself how you, how you look at yourself in the areas in which you can improve uh, and kind of keep yourself improving and and building step by step and it's in there, there is no end in that learning journey. There is, is no end in that progression. It's all about yourself and, and your own attitude and your own focus. I've always said a hard work, dedication and focus, and you can achieve whatever you want to achieve. And so it's all about that. There are some punches in the gut. And there's sometimes that I have been down in the dump. I have been depressed. I have been doubting myself and my abilities at times. But take that time, shake it off. And the best thing to do when you're in those moments is put that energy to work. And it doesn't matter what you do with that energy, whether you're reading a book or whether you're going to a, an acting class or whether you go to the gym or, or you do something creative, whether that's painting or kind of like woodwork, anything, anything to kind of get that energy out of you and kind of exercise it and, and use it for good, then you go again. So um, that was that bit one. What was it like being in EastEnders? Be being in EastEnders was a dream, my friend. You know, um, my mum and my nan loved EastEnders. They was always watching it. I grew up watching it. Uh, you couldn't phone my mum during the time that EastEnders was on. And, and these were like b before mobile phones. And even when the mobile phone was there, if EastEnders was on and the phone went, if you was lucky, if you was important, she'd pick up the phone and then she'd be like, I'm watching EastEnders and put the phone straight back down. So everybody would know, you know, give her a call back in 25 to 30 minutes. So I always grew up with it. And um, there was a stage around when, I, when we was doing DRD and stuff like that, I was just like, you know what? I, I would love to be on there. I, I think that it would be a lot of fun. And I think that I could bring something to it. I think that I could bring some light, some laughter, some brightness. And, and luckily just the kind of the, the character of Fatboy did turn up and, and I got an opportunity to bring all of those things to the square. And I was only ever supposed to be there for three months, um, ended up being there just under six years. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd done well to do that. Uh, people think that it's easy and you kind of, 
you, they, they kind of let you know that we, we're going to want you for five to six years. They don't. Everything for me, I had to earn. So those first three months, I had to show everybody at EastEnders that I was worthy of longer and that there was more to see from me. Uh, luckily, I managed to do that. And then, it, you know, that was a three to six month uh, contract. They So it got extended. And then they gave me another three to six month, which then got extended. And at the end of that first year, I managed to bag a couple of awards, uh, one of them being the National Television Award, which I was super proud of. I mean, I just, I mean, I didn't campaign for it. I didn't have no Twitter at that time. There wasn't no socials that I had. Um, um, I didn't go on no magazines and be like, vote for me. But the the people, I was in the list and, and the people chose to vote for me. And I ended up winning that and, and standing up at the O2 in front of so many people and you know, David Jason, one of my heroes, David Jason was sitting there in the front row and I just couldn't believe it. It was just blowing my mind that I was up there and I just, you know, I've just kind of walked past David Jason, Del Boy, and um, I'm, I'm here and he's looking at me like, what's that about? And and, and a boy from Forest Gate that ended up kind of going through that whole journey to kind of at the end of that first year where it was, it was for myself, it was touch and go whether I, I, it was going to get, get extended again. I, I never knew. Um, but after I got that award, it kind of solidified a lot of things and kind of cemented me um, in Albert Square. And, and luckily I, I managed to have those, those five to six years there, you know, and again, you know, I, I still speak to a lot of people there and I've still got a lot of love for everybody at EastEnders and Albert Square and the Queen Vic and the Chippy, you know, and the allotment. I've got a, I've got a lot of love for that place and it was fantastic. Great place to learn your craft as well because everything is done very, very quickly. So for instance, I've done a film and we might have done three scenes in a day. And I'm talking about a full on day, full like 11 to 12 hours sometimes. We might do three to four scenes a day, but in EastEnders, in the same time period, well, less actually, we would do at a minimum 12. So 12 scenes would be on the schedule. And not all of the time would you be in every single one of them, but there would be days where you, you would be in every single one of them. And you yeah. would have to be on your game and not, know your scenes inside backwards and be ready to perform and, and because we nobody there was just wasn't that time, so you always just had to make sure that you was ready, and um, make it happen. So it was a it was a great learning place. I got to work with some fantastic actors there, and I got to learn so much there, and it really kept me on my toes. Um, and it was just a lovely place to be, honestly, lovely place to be. There's always work politics wherever you go, and there was always a little niggle. So by the end of the, my time there, I was feeling that niggle. But overall, um, it was a fantastic place. They've got some fantastic writers there, fantastic actors, some awesome directors. And um, it was just lovely to be in that bubble and to be able to go to all of those award shows and, and you know, and all of those little events that I just w were a dream for me growing up. And then the last question, Chris, was? Uh, a return, possible. Oh, oh, Is it a return, a return. possible? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, I haven't heard anything, but um, over Christmas, um, there was the episodes of Dot's funeral. So June, as a, you know, as the majority of you know, passed away last year. And I was, you know, me, me and June got on like a house on fire. There'd be many a time that we'd be in a long scene in the Vic and we'd be in the corner and the cameras wouldn't be on us. And she would just kind of sit there and kind of, she'd like slag off, not slag off in a, in a nasty way, but she'd just kind of crack joke in her character on all the other characters around. But she'd be like, oh, look at her. Did she think she is walking in like that? Who done her it? And like, she'd just give me these little things and we'd just sit there and giggle. And I used to make her tea and bring her in cake in the, in, in the morning. She never used to eat, but so I, I always used to bring her in a little cake and, not everybody can make her tea the way that she liked it. So I used to make sure that I made it for her and so that she would have tea and cake and at least she's got something in her stomach. And we got on like a house on fire. But um, over Christmas, they'd done her, her funeral episode, which was, again, another fantastic episode that was 
you know, really well written and directed and and really heartfelt and was deserved for somebody who had been on the square for that amount of time and that had given so much to EastEnders. Yeah. Um, and within that, there was, and I didn't know about this, um, there was a card that was sent uh, for Dot and for the funeral and a, an eagle-eyed fan paused, paused the TV, zoomed in on the card, and it was from uh, it, it was to Mrs. B um, from Fats. So, you know, uh, you know, when I left, technically my character was dead, but nobody saw the body from what all the fans tell me. And so, for them to put in a card that was that was you know a, a kind of you know rest in peace type of card from Fats kind of opens the door but again it's not my decision it's got nothing to do with me i i love the place if they call me i would obviously sit down and speak to them but it's, it's to do with those guys so the, the 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 door is slightly ajar and so you just never know you never know so watch this space um ricky third question for you why tottenham hotspur oh well that's to do with my dad my dad's bethnal green born and bred and uh, Bethnal Green in East London is a Tottenham area. There was a pub, um, I think it was called The Approach, but I know it was on Approach Road. Uh, and that used to be a big Tottenham pub as well. And, and when I was growing up, my dad used to take me there. Um, my dad was obsessed, or still is obsessed with Tottenham. He used to get stupid angry. I know me and you get angry sometimes, Chris, but if you would have seen my dad back in the day, my God goodness everybody used to just leave the house everyone just used to scatter you just just find find your corner and scatter let's get out um so yeah it was a lot to do with my dad really and um growing up there was a point where i think it might have been and i'm guessing now but i think it might have been between like 12 and 16 there wasn't too much for me and my dad to speak about but I think FIFA 98 came out at one point and, you know, that was on the PlayStation 1 and I jumped on that and I just got super obsessed knowing all the players. Then that's the way I got to know all the players. And then I think it was around 16, my dad took me to a game and the thing that we spoke about and the way that we communicated was through football. And that's how me and him really started to speak. You know, we'd speak about the game or we'd speak about players, we'd speak about suspensions or the manager or what's going on, what do we feel that needs to go right, or who do we feel that we should sign in the, in, in the, in the transfer window and stuff like that. And it was a great way to kind of connect with my dad and to speak and to get to know each other again. And, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to say now that me and my dad are really good friends, as well as father and son, but we're, we're, we're really good friends. And we can sit there and speak about anything now. It doesn't have to be about football. But for a long time, that was the way we, that we communicated. So I, looking back, I, I probably gravitated even more towards Tottenham and knowing it inside backwards so that I had something to say to my dad and so that I could connect with him. So, yeah, it's, it's my dad's fault. <laughs> Do you know what, Rick? I, that is one thing I love about going to see Spurs home and away. Friends, family, um, you know, just people you know, people who sit around you it is just, you know, the whole day is just fantastic. Um, win, lose or draw, of course. Win, lose or um, draw. Ricky, what's your favourite ever memory supporting Spurs? Oh, my favourite ever memory. There's, there's, see, there, there's kind of two. The 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 first one is the, is my first game, which ended up, being a nil-nil draw with Charlton at home. Of course it was at home. Um, and it was just, you know, after all the stories, after all the kind of the talk and the, and the anger and the frustration at home with my dad and stuff like that, to be able to go. Because my mum didn't want me to go for ages. She, she thought it was just going to be trouble basically she yeah. was gonna you know i was gonna get myself in trouble or i, I was gonna you know be in a ditch or somewhere at the or the law lost <laughs> at the end of the game or something but um so i had to kind of wait until i was old enough to go so uh, you, the memory that always comes to mind is is the first time walking into white lane and and 
seeing the Bible man as well. There used to be a little kind of guy that he, he only had like a little tray. It was almost like a like an airport trolley almost. But he used to stand there and used to have all the Bibles and you could have one of those and and just walking up those stairs and seeing the pitch for the first time, it was just phenomenal. Just just blew my head away and it was just um, such a spe- and again it was a nil nil. So it wasn't the most exciting of games. And we was right up at the back um as well. But just being there and being surrounded by it and, and then being in a in in a in in a stadium that was full of people that that loved and breathed and and felt the frustration as well as you to be to be connected to all of these people, you know, around this stadium, kind of ooing and ahhing at the same time. And when somebody's scuffed a shot or it's gone wayward or something like that, everyone's ah and everyone's doing this. And to be connected like that. And again, with my dad as well, but to be connected like that to everybody that 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 loved Tottenham as much as we did, or even more at that stage, and um, felt felt the highs and the lows with you. You know, it wasn't just you at home, or it wasn't just something that that was kind of trivial. You know, like my my dad's anger sometimes was described as trivial. What are you getting angry for? It's just the game and all of that, and you're just. Throw that out the window, and when you're in a stadium full of surrounded by forty or grand of people, all feeling the same, it was just it just made sense. So that's definitely one of my my, my fondest memories. Um, oh, see, I don't know whether to go. Oh, the the other one, the other memory. All right, because I'm sure I'll get to speak about Ginola a bit later. But the other memory that I've got is the the first cup final which was the 99 Wurverton Cup final. And me and my dad, first time to Wembley, me and my dad, we've gone down there and dad didn't have no tickets. No tickets, right? I didn't know this. I, just, I thought we was going and like, dad's like, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. So anyway, we're at Wembley now, the old Wembley. And we're walking around Wembley and dad's looking for ticket touts do you know what i mean he's like you know he's having a look he, I, I didn't know that this was a plan but yeah he's having a look he's having a look it was against leicester yeah. and there's me i've got i've got me you know me tottenham top on pups he's bought me a tottenham hat as well the big top hatty floppy hats and uh so we're walking around anyway finds finds one guy with, with, with tickets and he's like i can't remember how much it was but he was like he only had the one right and it was for stupid money i I can't remember i'm gonna guess at like 150 to 200 quid something like that right for the one ticket and my dad tried to haggle him a little bit he's like come on come on it's his first cup final that's this that and the other and the guy wasn't having it so my dad gave him literally he gave him all the money that he had right for this one ticket and he couldn't even come in with me right so he ended up going to the pub and I ended up going in. And where was the ticket, Chris? It was in the Leicester end, wasn't it? It was oh, in the no. Leicester end, mate. Oh, no. It was in the Leicester end. So there's me, top on. I've got a little jacket. So I've done the... My dad's like, do your jacket up. But I've still got the Tottenham hat, hat on, right? So I've gone in there. I, it was a lovely row as well. I could see everything. But while I was in there, there were other Tottenham in the Leicester end. And every time that they jumped up, and shouted like an ooh or an ah oh, or something like that. They were getting thumped. They were getting trampled on. Like they were there. It, there was madness happening in the stand. So there's me trying to stay quiet, you know, trying to like not show anybody that I'm Tottenham because it's his first game at Wembley by myself. Do you know what I mean? Dad's not with me. I'm getting. I'm there's about two, three rows back. There's one Leicester fan, old dude that's clocked that I'm Tottenham, and as soon as he's clocked. He started shouting nastiness towards me. Then he started frying beer over me. I'm like, oh, come on. Do you know, I'm just trying to sit there. I don't want to react. I don't want to do nothing. But he's pelting beer over me. Then his friends are pelting beer. I'm like, oh, come on. Like, what is going on here? And so at half time, I've gone up to the stairs. I've gone to find a steward. And I'm like, listen, is there any way that I can just stand here? And he's like, no, health and safety, you can't stand here. You can't do that. I'm like, oh, mate. I said, is there any way that I can get ran for the Tottenham side? No, you can't do that. You can't do that. This, that, and the other. So it gets to the end of, end of half time. I go to 
go back into my seat and the two dudes that were throwing beer over me, now they're in my seat and they're just looking at me and I was just like, all right then. So I turned around, walked out of the stadium, went round to the Tottenham side, couldn't find my dad, no mobile phones again, went round to the Tottenham side. So I'm sitting outside the Tottenham side, um, reading my po- program, listening to the, the oohs and the ahs and the sounds of Tottenham to try and figure out what the score is or what's happening. And then about 85 minutes, the, these back doors open, right? And I'm like, what is that? What's going on here? But the back doors open to, to let everybody out once the game yeah. finished. But what I'd done was I just ran in and I ran all the way. I didn't know where I was going. I went all the way. I ended up going all the way to the top of Wembley to, I don't know where, I went into um, into one of the top tiers and I don't even know how I got a seat, but I got a seat there and I ended up seeing the Nielsen header, right? So I ended up seeing the goal and then I stayed there to watch him walk up the stairs and lift that trophy, you know? And everybody, I was in the Tottenham side, everybody was going potty. It was absolute madness. Um, and so I got to see him lift the trophy. So that was amazing. But uh, then I had to try and find my dad. Ended up finding him around the station. He found me, to be fair. Um, just grabbed my shoulder. So I went, come on, son. He'd already, he, he's drunk as a skunk at this point because he's gone in there and let everybody know that he spent all his money on one ticket for his son on his first cup final. So Tottenham looked after him. They was like, right, don't you worry, bruv. I've got you. I've got you. So he just kept putting pints in front of him. And then the last bit, just so that I tell you, on the train back, everybody was singing on the train. Fantastic. Get to Liverpool Street and there's a pub um, up at the corner just by the escalators. Um, so we've gone to that pub. A ton of Tottenham are in this pub as well. And I t- I'll try and be quick with it. Um, so we're having a drink in there. Well, Dad's having a drink anyway. He gets up on the table in a Witherspoons. Now, there ain't no music. There ain't no vibe in the Witherspoons. You can't get away with these things in the Witherspoons. But he's on. He's like, hey, and he's singing a Tottenham song. A police officer comes in. <laughs> a police officer's come in and he's like, sorry, sir, can you come down? And I'm like, I'm like, dad, dad, come on. Like, it's the police now. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, dad, come on, come on. Like, sort it out. Come on. He gets down. He goes, ah, mate, we've just won. Gives the copper a cuddle and a kiss on the cheek. I'm like, what's go- oh, we're going to get arrested here. We are going to get arrested. What's going on here? But he was like, oh, all right, mate, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he got down. But, like, we got home safe. Everything was fine. No police trouble or anything like that. But definitely those two memories are, are, are the fondest of, of uh, watching Tottenham Hotspur. What a fantastic story. And, and I love it, the fact that you've spoke about you winning a trophy already and you've spoke about Tottenham winning a trophy already. Uh, fantastic. What um, What's the best goal you've ever seen Spurs score? There, there, there are a couple, but I've got to be, I've, I've got to go back to my bias. So my, um, thank you, Declan. Um, my um, favourite player ever, favourite player ever is David Ginola. And the reason that I love him so much, it's a bit like Sonny. He, he, he gives you the Sonny feels. The fact that he just came and had always had a smile on his face, played with swagger, played with class. And yeah. that, that goal against Barnsley, where he just darted through about five, six, and just weaved through and scored, that's one of my favourite goals ever. And, and it, it, it was like one of the first times that I had like electricity and tingles from... from from toe to tip, let me tell you. From it, it went from it started at the feet and everything. I was like, ah! I went mad. It was like there was something. I, I, it was like it was like I got possessed by somebody. Do you know what I mean? It was it was just an electric feeling. And and what he brought to Tottenham and the way that he he every time he picked up the ball, he was just silky. You know, I, I loved him to bits. Loved you know to bits, and so much so that um, I'll squeeze this in as well. In 99, I think it was 99, that he won the PFA Player of the Year and all of that, and Writers Player of the Year. Um, well, 99 was when my little baby sister was born. And I got an opportunity to kind of give her a middle name. And so I just had to work it on my mum. I was like, like, her first name is Karina. And I was like, Ma, but come on, like, Karina Ginola. Karina Ginola sounds really nice, though, doesn't it? I mean, like, how, do, how nice does that come off? Karina Ginola? I was like, come on, Ma. So I ended up giving my little sister no as a middle name. Yeah, yeah. It's it's on her birth certificate, it's on her ID, it's on everything. 
It, and and that's what wow. she goes by right now. Yeah, she goes by Karina Ginola. Wow, wow. Yeah. Um, Ricky, if you were on a desert island for a week and you had to take yeah. three items with you and a former Spurs player, what would the three items be, and who would be the player? Three items. So I would. 100% need um, a musical device, whether that's like a CD player and a, and, and a speaker or some type, because I would need some Bob Marley in my life. All right. So, you know, you know, Bob has been there for me in, in, in the highs and in the lows. You know, there's Spurs always a message well. there. There we go. He's, yeah, he, he saw him doing the kick up to a Spurs top on. Yeah. Um, so I would need some type of musical device to hear some Bob Marley. Most definitely. Um, there would have to be. Oh, I think I, I think I would need a notepad and pen. I know that sounds crazy, but I would need a notepad and pen because just like acting wise, you know, or creative to, to be able to write bits and pieces, you know, yeah. whether that's an, a sketch idea or a story idea or something like that, I would definitely need some uh, one of those. And then a packet of cards as well. I think the third one would be a packet of cards because, you know, especially on a boring night, you can have a lot of fun with a packet of cards. And even if you're by yourself, you can play a bit of patience. And I, I, I love the kind of, there's a thing called cardistry, which is, it's a bit like card juggling, really. You, you can do loads of things. You can do riff boards. You can, you can kind of just do tricks with, with, a, with a packet of cards. And um, yeah. So I, I think just to have that, to have something to do with my hands as well. And the player, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean it'd be David Ginola all day long. All day long. I mean, who wouldn't want to be on a beach with David Ginola? I mean, come on. <laughs> We'd be working on our tans beside each other. Do you know what I mean? I'd be like, come on, sunshine. Who would have the best six pack? Oh, he would. Come on. He would. <laughs> all day long. He would. I'd be I'd be looking I'd be looking in the bloody well picnic basket for my six six pack a six pack of beer is what I'll be looking for. Ricky, if you had to take one of these Tottenham managers out for dinner, who would you take and why? Christian Gross, <laughs> Nuno, okay, Nuno Espirito Santo, and Christian Stellini. Oh come on. <laughs> uh, okay, what one more time? One more time. Christian Gross, Stellini. Who was the first one? Nuno, you've forgotten about him already. Jesus. Um, probably Stellini. Uh, probably Stellini. I, I, I don't think I've got anything. To, I, don't, I don't think Nuno would be a great conversationalist. You know, we, we saw him like stroke his beard many a time instead of answer a question in the press conferences. So I don't think there would be much stories there. Christian Gross, I mean, I don't think I've got anything to say to Christian Gross. But at least with Stellini, you'd get some stories, whether that be about Antonio or Italy or, you know, the players that he's played with or the players that he's coached over the years. You know, there'd be some dynamite stories in there, I think. So, yeah, out of the three, I'm going to say Stellini. <laughs> oh, 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 goodness. You thought they were going to be three good managers, didn't you? I did. I did. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Who, um, you've already answered this, but um, give me your five favourite players okay. that have played for Tottenham, either past or present? Um, well, I mean, you got to chuck in Harry Kane and Sonny in there. And then, obviously, Ginola. I've told you he's my number one. Um, Gareth Bow, most definitely. Ledley King as well. I think that's the five. I love Ledley to bits. And he, and he wore the number 26, which was... Um, the day of my birthday. Um, uh, also, you know, one of our own came through it, gave everything for the club, even when it, you know, the, as the famous song goes, he had no knees. Or oh, he only had one knee, sorry. Um, but gave everything for us, always left everything on the field. What a phenomenal defender as well. If it wasn't for those injuries, I think he would have been one of the best for England and one of the absolute best for Tottenham. And I think we would be in a totally different place if um, if he was fully fit during his time. Um, love Gareth. Gareth was the other one that kind of gave me that Ginola feel again. I, I was so happy and proud that he was at our club. And I remember that first season where he was a bit of a bad luck charm 
where every time he came on, we lost. But then once he kicked into gear, oh my gosh, he was just phenomenal. Um, he stride, his pace, the way that he would take a player on, the goals that he scored, the volleys, the, the outside the box shots. He was just, he was next level, man. Uh, absolutely next level. And, you know, as I've said about Ginola, he's the number one for me, always will be. Uh, when he had a little, you know, when he had a heart attack a couple of years ago, I was devastated. Yeah. I was, I was, uh, I was almost sick. Like he was part of my family, but um, yeah. I was just happy that he got back on his feet, and I'm happy that he's, you know, smiling again on TV and doing the damn thing. And and then Harry and Sonny. I mean, Sonny, just the smile of him. Again. He he he, he kind of comes on the back of that type of player of, of off of Ginola, off of a bail. Somebody who's come come comes in. He has got a hella swagger as well. Always plays with a smile on his face. Is polite. Is courteous. Uh, is humble. Um, and I love that. You know, in, in a player, um, and especially at Spurs. And then Harry. I mean, my gosh, how lucky are we to have somebody again that's come through the academy that was doubted. Um, you know, nobody ever saw him kind of being a starter, especially when he came in. We had Adebayor and Soldado in front of him. And, you know, it, it was just not not the done thing to kind of put one of your own up front as a number nine or a number 10. But look at what he's achieved. And being our, our, our you know, all-time top goal scorer, what a player and what a man. Again, a, another one that kind of handles himself with class and dignity and, and humility. Um, he could be, you know, he could be egotistical and he could be arrogant and he could be like a, he could be as in a, a type of a Zlatan type of player. Not that Zlatan is negative, but, you know, Zlatan is all about himself and he could be that way, but he's not. And, you know, it doesn't matter how much, how many goals he or, or awards that he receives, he's going to keep that same core and that same kind of, um, that heart about him. And, uh, oh, easy. Yeah, and, and keep that heart about him. So, yeah, definitely those th those five are my top five favourites. Ricky, if you could ask Hunmin Son one question, what would you ask him? Oh. Oh, what would I ask him? What's the best Korean dish to have, maybe? That's a nice kind of trivial one. But I, do you know what? I, I'd like to know about that him as a person. I'd like to know about him growing up and where did, where he found his love for football and, and, and what kept him going, especially in the dark days, you know, um, whether that of being, you know, flying from South Korea to Germany and kind of away from your home and, and, and trying to build up his reputation. Um, but even now, you know, when he first got with us, there was a dark period. He wasn't really getting in. And at the end of that first season, he could have been off. Um, but Poch sat down and spoke to him. And Poch saw what type of player he was. He just needed to draw it out. And as soon as he did, I mean, what a phenomenal player again. But now, even now, going through this, he's had a, a bit of a tough season this season. We haven't seen the Sonny that we, we know and love. And I would, mm. I'd love to kind of ask him, like, what motivates him to get back up and what gets him through those dark days? You know, that, that'd be a, a, a lovely kind of um, point of view to kind of to, to have from, from his point of view, you know? Rick, if you could bring back one Spurs player from the past in his prime to play for this current team, who would it be? For this current team? Yeah, what do we, what do we really need? What, what ex-player in their prime do we need in this current team? I mean, we need a few, but I, I would probably say that Ledley in his prime, if he was fully fit, I think Ledley would be dynamite. But I've got to give you a couple of others. I mean, Toby and Yan in this system, in this team would be dynamite. Edgar Davids would be dynamite in the midfield. Van der Vaart as a creative midfielder or a number 10, he would be dynamite in this. Um, I, I, I knew you wouldn't only give me one because there was a I whole list of, of players that we need. Yeah. I can't, yeah, there's a, a whole list. But if I was, if I could only pick the one, then I'd pick Ledley. Not only for his defensive abilities um, and his defensive awareness, but his leadership as well. Um, I, I think he could be tremendous alongside Romero 
on one side and and Longley or Davies on the other. I, I think he he would transform us. Rick, if you could choose the next Spurs manager, who would you choose? I mean, he's magic. So you know, he's magic. He's magic. The, 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 I've said it many a time on the pod. Pochettino gave us as a as a fan base so much. And and I know he didn't get over the line with, with a trophy. But I wouldn't want George Graham back, who won us a trophy, and I wouldn't want Ramos back, who won us a trophy. There was something different about Pochettino that you know, Nuno spoke about making us proud. Well, Pochettino was the one that made me proud, you know. Yeah. Um he he dispelled every hoodoo that we had, every away ground that we didn't win at, he won at. Um, he dispelled every kind of hate or wrong. Every time that there was uh, a word said against him, he went out and, and proved everybody wrong. He had class. Um, he had dig- dignity, he, especially in the press conference. I mean, I, I miss those press conferences. He, even with a dodgy question, he, w- he was one who approached it with the right mind. And he loved us. He loved us. I don't think I've ever seen another manager We've had some great managers in my time, but I don't think I've ever seen another one who who bled blue and white, who who loved having a cockerel on his chest, who wanted to do so much for this team and and to kind of take him to the heights that we we hadn't been been at. And you know, we we might have reached a height before, but we'd soon drop off. And what Poch done was consistently kind of keep us pushing, keep us pushing, keep us pushing. And and a lot of people would like to speak about the last five months. Of, of his reign well I, I would say look at his first five months you know I think people forget that we I, I remember us being at the top of the charts of everything whether that was passing goals scored goals created crosses headers defense you know no goals can you know the, the comebacks in in the 85th or the 90th minute there was there was so much that he gave us and it, it really did break my heart after Ginola left that was the last player that broke my heart and i said there won't be another one and however much i loved jermaine defoe is another one that i've missed out as well yeah. um however much i loved jermaine or or gareth or anybody else i, I'm, I wasn't going to love anybody as much as i loved ginola but pochettino i i i loved a lot do you know what i mean i loved a lot and when he when he got the sack I actually screamed out a no in my house. I was doing the washing up at the time. And I screamed out a no. And my missus came down. She's like, whoa, 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 what's happened? What's happened? She literally thought some I, I'd either broken something, like my arm or something like that, or or like somebody had somebody had, had died and I just got that text. But like the the in an acting kind of front, the tone of the no yeah. said something horrific had happened. And then yeah. I had to turn to her and go, they've sacked Pochettino. And she was like, no. And she went up the stairs. But I, it, it hit me in my gut. It hit me in the bottom of my heart because of, if you know, for everything that he gave us, I just believe that he deserved a lot more than what, what the club gave him. Um, I think they, they should have, could have backed him in the sense of, they didn't back him over those 520 odd days or 50 days or whatever it was. I think. But they... 18 but they could have backed him in at, at, at that spell because it was the first time that we had dipped and um all right we dipped for a, for a period of time but i believe that if he would have got what he was asking for which was the painful rebuild that we wouldn't have had that dip or that dip wouldn't have been as harsh you know um but i believe that he had a lot more credit in the bank and a bit like liverpool and clock right now if Liverpool sacked Klopp right now, you even though that they've had a, 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 a not a, a a bit of a shocking season to their standards, then everybody would be like, "What? Why? Why would you do that?" And that's how I felt with Poch. What did you shout out when Jose was sacked? I didn't really. I didn't. I didn't shout anything out. Um, what about Nuno? I. I. I, I, I it's, it's, See you later, is what I shouted out. See you later, sunshine. <laughs> jog on. Jog on, mate. Jog on. Um, yeah, no. Nah, I mean, you know, when, when Marino was sacked, it was wrapped up all in the Super League as well. 
You know, he got sacked on one day, and I think it was by the evening that whole Super League stuff came out. Yeah. And I'm st- I'm still confused about why he was sacked. Like the reason from the club's point of view, you know, like I, I don't think I've ever heard a, a, a reason um, from the club, even if they came out and said, oh, we just didn't believe in the football that he was playing or something. Along the- I, I still haven't got a, an idea of why he was sacked at that time, but it was wrapped up in that Super League. And I, I was just upset that we brought in a win now manager, somebody who was going to win us a trophy, who had a reputation of winning everywhere that he's gone. Yeah. And six days before a final, we get rid of him. And I was just like, well, what was the point in that? Just It's just a bit of wasted time. Do you know what I mean? He's got us there and then you're going to sack him before the final. What was the point in that? So That's uh, yeah. two, two, two years ago tomorrow, that'll be. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Ricky, next question for you. Um, you being the next James Bond for one <laughs> film yeah. or managing Spurs for one match? Oh, you motherfucking yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Ooh. All right. Um, I think I'm going to have to go with... I think Are it'd you... have to be Bond. I think it'd have to be Bond, you know. I think it would have to be. I mean, I, I, I look. I don't have the skills to manage like that. I could pick a team, definitely, but I don't know if I would have the skills and the know-how to give those players what they needed to go out there and perform. But you give me the bond job, and I'm going to go out there and perform, mate. I'm going to leave it all out there, and the the, the gadgets, the stunts, you know, <laughs> the, the 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 locations, the sexy locations, being in the sunshine. Oh my gosh! Oh, that would be amazing. That would be phenomenal. Uh, oh my! I'm just thinking about the gadgets right now. Can you imagine me with a little watch and a, a zip line or something? Do you know what I mean? Like, come on! Who doesn't want to play Bond? Yes, I think I'd have to go Bond. I've really thought that you'd want to manage Spurs for one match. I know it's tough. This is a tough one, but I know I can see how long I've taken already. So I'm just trying to get to it. So yeah, I know it would be. T- it would be so nice to sit in that that dugout and 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 kind of be a manager for that amount of time. Maybe if you and Darren Hart was my number twos and coaches, do you know what I mean? If you two are beside me, then maybe like we, we could go and do it. But if I was in there by myself, oh, I don't know, mate. I don't know. We, we wouldn't get a word in. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, Spurs to win the Champions League or England yeah. to win the World Cup? Spurs to win the Champions League. That was a quick one. Spurs to be the champ Again, like, uh, uh, you know, with the heartbreak, you know, uh, England's a lot of heartbreak. And you've said it many a time. To be a uh, Tottenham fan and an England fan, my gosh, you know, that's a yeah. lot of strain. That's a lot of stress. Um, but, yeah, there was a... I can't remember what tournament it was, but I just started falling out of love with England a little bit. But Tottenham's my life, mate. You know, Tottenham's every day. Tottenham... I, if there's one, you know, whether it's a podcast or something that's written um, about Tottenham or there's a YouTube video, you know, that's how I found you, Chris, you know, because you was walking around the Tottenham Stadium giving me updates about what panels are going in where, do you know what I mean, every week. And so Tottenham's my life. I love Tottenham to pieces. And it, it hurts when, when we're in places like this, when we're, when we're in a kind of... Uh, not a great place in the league or playing great or the mood's not great, but I love them to bits. And I remember during the U- Nuno time that we, I, we, I came down for the Aston Villa game. And before then it wasn't great. But yeah. I remember I remember saying to you as soon as I walked in and, and like I was upset, you know, I was thinking about all of the rubbish that had been happening around Tottenham. And I was, I was upset, but as soon as I got there and I looked at the stadium outside, it just took my breath away again. And I started getting excited. And as soon as I walked in and we saw the pitch and I'm like, oh, I know it's been terrible, but I'm excited to be home. Do you know what I mean? And it, it, there's something that Tottenham is to me that I just, you know, I, I don't know if I can even describe it, mate. It's just, it just gives me something. It, 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 it sings to my heart. And um, I, I, I love going through the highs and the lows with them. And, and that's why... I, as we say, win, lose or draw, come on you Spurs. Do you know what I mean? It, th- that's why I, I won't I won't really mind coming on after a defeat on here or anywhere else. Do you know, I'll be like, look, all right, fine. We'll speak about it. And 
sometimes you'll get my kind of my not so nice face and you'll get not so nice rants do you know what I mean in different tones but um but they're my club and I love them to bits and there's nothing more that that I want than to see them succeed and see us all succeed together and and yeah. even the even the worst player you know I I, I don't want to see them fail I want to see them succeed I want to see them climb and I want to see them be the world class player that we all thought that they were when they turn up you know so um, yeah it would be Tottenham all day long hopefully success is not that far away um, come on come on yeah um, Ricky your favourite drink and favourite meal on a night out okay alright well, uh, well that's that's, that's, a, that's a good one favourite drink br- brandy and coke I will have a double brandy and a touch of coke uh, Cavassier I like a Cavass or a Hennessy but mostly Cavassier uh, favourite meal on a night out I think you, you can't go you can't go wrong with a good steak. Um, but I'm going to have to chuck in my two other favourites, which is Turkish. I love a chicken sheesh. Oh, my gosh. Chicken sheesh. Yeah. Mwah. And um, a chicken jow frazy curry-wise. I, I can't go nowhere without those two in my life. So, yeah. But you can't go wrong with a steak, especially on a night out. I always get criticised because I like my steak well done. How do you oh, yeah, like me yours? too, mate. Me too. Me too. Yeah? I like it well done, bruv. I like it well done. My, my missus that doesn't come from that place. So she, recently, when I go out with her, I'll have it medium to well. Yeah. Because everybody suddenly everybody gets offended because you said it well yeah. done. So I'll have it medium to well when I'm out with her. But but mate, I, I grew up with my my meat being well done. Do you know what I mean? So I can't go and have no pink pink ass, you know, or red or the the, <laughs> the dripping and all. I can't do it. I can't eat it. So yeah. Yeah, I'm with you, bro. We've got to go to a steakhouse soon and both get a nice, well-done steak, bro. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, What's the weirdest request you've ever had from a fan? (laughs) To sign their bum. Um, (laughs) I was, I was, I I was doing a, I was doing a club PA night, and it was in Scotland. I think, I think it was, I think it was in Edinburgh. It might have been Glasgow, but it was in one of the two. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, like sometimes I've been in there and, and you, you'll meet and greet and sometimes the girls will be like, can you sign my chest? And, and when I tell you, like, I, you know, I'm like doing it from a distance. I'm, I'm doing it like, you know, I'm like, OK, all right. And I'll do it all up here in the top corner. Do you know what I mean? I'll be like, all right, cool. And the, the pen never works. Right. But there was this girl in Scotland at one point and um, she was like, Ricky, would you... <laughs> She was like, well, would, you, would, you, would you sign my body uh, because I'm going to get a, ta- a tattoo? And I said, what? I said, are you sure? She was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, I said well, what do you want? Do you want my name or do you want, like, character? Do you want fat boy? She was like, no, I want fat boy. So I'm like, all right. I'm, I was like, I'm fine. And be, I didn't know where it was, but as I'm saying, all right, I'm fine. She gives me the pen. Then she turns around and lifts up her skirt. And she's like, can you write it on my bum? And I was like, what? the hell are we doing here like what are we doing here like what is going on so on one cheek again I, I didn't I didn't I didn't even I didn't hold to to write I'd done it from a distance again do you know what I mean so um, on one cheek there was fat and then on the other cheek there was boy um, and I, I, I really hope she didn't get that tattooed on her backside I really hope she didn't but yeah that's one of the weirdest requests that I've had I didn't expect that I must say <laughs> Ricky, if you played for Tottenham, what position would you play? I mean, I've got no left foot, but I would be <laughs> left. I, I would be left wing, and I would have the number fourteen on my, on, on me back, and I would be in Ginola's position. Do you know what I mean? That's where I would play. Um, again, like I say, I've got no left foot. You know, um, but yeah, it would it would be on that left side um, with the number fourteen on my back and trying to be Ginola. I'd have to put in some hair extensions so I could get the hair going. But yeah, that that's where I'd be. Who's the most famous person in your phone book? In my phone book? Bloody hell. Um, oh, my phone's there. It's there. I can't even have a look. Um, oh, oh, okay. Vanessa. Yeah, Vanessa Hudgens. So I worked with Vanessa on the Princess Switch films. And, you know, I don't know how many she's got on Instagram, but I, I think it's like 14, 15 million or it might be 
more than that. It might be something like 50 million. Um, but yeah, she's, you know, uber famous. She's, you know, superstar famous. Everywhere she goes, she's known. Uh, some would know her through High School Musical uh, and growing up with her that way, but she's uh, been in loads of different films and she's phenomenal. She's uh, And she, she doesn't really <clears throat> walk with the fame. She's really down to earth, really lovely girl and just super, super talented. I, I saw her on, on the Switch films. I saw her play three characters in the same scene, pretty much back to back. So she would film one character for an hour, go off, get changed and made up again, film the second one, go off, change and made up and then film the third one. And she would, I, I, you know, and I was in the scene the whole time. So I never left. I was, I, I'd do it with, with each new Vanessa character that turned up. And I saw her like interact with herself without herself being there. So yeah. obviously it's a bit late eyes. It's a bit of visual effects and stuff like that to get the three Vanessas on at the same time. Um, but she would like, in one speech, she would, she would be talking, talking, and then she'd look at her, nobody's there, but she's looking at herself. And when you'd see it put together on the monitor, you'd be, I, I was just like, this girl's phenomenal. And she would go, she, would, she was one that was in every single day. She was in every single day, you know, from seven in the morning till the very last one at night, 11s at 12s at night. So, um, yeah, she's phenomenal. So, yeah, that's the that's the most famous person I suppose I've got in my me, me phone book without checking it. Johnny Hotspur has just said that Vanessa has 49.5 million followers on Instagram. There you go. There you go. Wow. I, wow. Yeah, it, in my head, it was like 14. Or, it, it, it was just like I had to rationalise it. I was like 14 or 15 mil. But then I knew it could be something like 40 to 50 mil. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah. Wow. She's, yeah. She's Ricky, lovely. can you name the starting 11 for Tottenham the last time we won the FA Cup in 1991? No, I can't name the starting 11, but I know Gazza was there. Um, oh, goodness. Was was uh ninety one? Was Lineker there in ninety one? Yeah. Um, uh, Lineker, Gaza, um, uh, Mabbott. Yeah. Um. Oh, mate. Um. It wasn't Eric Torsford in goal, was it? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Was it? Go on, yeah. get in. Um, Torsford. Um. Oh, that is tough. Um, See, it goes to show it's it's been so long. It has. It's been a while, isn't it? Oh, mate. Yeah. No, I, I'm going to stick there. I can't. I can't. I can't find it. I can't find. Well, I think we've done well. The, uh, it's going to come to me in a little while. You're going to ask me like another question in a minute, and then then I'll remember a couple more. Well, we, we, we've got Eric Torsvet. Edinburgh, Vanden Howe, Sedgley, Howes, Mabbott, Stewart, Gaza, Samways, Lineker, and Allen. Vinny Samways, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And oh, and, I... and in those days, only two subs, Walsh and Naeem. Oh, Naeem. I was going to say Naeem, you know, but I didn't know whether he was there at that time. Naeem from the halfway line. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Ugh. Ricky, next question. I'm going to give you three clubs. One needs to go out of existence. One relegated from the Premier League, and the other one you have to wear their shirt for a week in public. Oh goodness! All right, Arsenal, Chelsea, West Ham. All right, now give me the permutations again. So Who one needs Chelsea to go out of existence. One goodness. is going to be relegated, and you're going to wear their shirt. The, the other one's going to be relegated, and I'm going to wear their shirt. No, uh, out oh, of okay. existence is one. Uh, relegated right. two. And you're going to wear their shirt for a week out in public. Oh, mate. Gooners, I said someone wouldn't be awkward. Gooners, Chelsea to be relegated. And I probably would... Oh, I can't even say it. But the last one would be West Ham. And it wouldn't be West Ham. And I'll tell you this really, really quickly because my battery's dying and I've got to get the charger over there. But in EastEnders, there was a football game once. And... Um, uh, and with EastEnders as well, I've got to tell you, my only request when I got in there was that Fat Boy was a Tottenham fan. He wasn't going to be a Gooner and he wasn't going to be West Ham. I had to let him know that there's more teams in London than West Ham. 
So yeah, I, I, and that's where I, I had Tottenham gloves, I had Tottenham scarf. I, I'd bring in as much Tottenham as I could bring in. But there was a football game that was being filmed, and um, there was a stag party. I think it was Jack's stag party, and basically, basically the the scene I was supposed to be in a scene where I met the football team afterwards. Um, but when I went to my dressing room, there's this kit hanging up in my in my, in, my, in my kind of dressing room. I'm like, what what's this about? And and it's claret and blue. It's 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 an you know it's a take on West Ham. And I'm just like, what's this about? And they're like, oh yeah, Ricky, we want you in the kit because you know it's like you was playing with the guys and this and however. Listen, let me tell you how quick my brain worked. I went up and I was speaking to the uh, to the director and I was like, listen, guys, I'm really not in that scene. I wasn't playing football with those guys. I don't think I should wear that, you know. Actually, because I, I meet everybody at the Vic, I think I should be in my normal clothes because uh, especially being in the stag and sorting out the stag in the Vic, I don't think that I would be playing the football. So, and they was like, oh yeah, Ricky, you know what, you're right. And I was like, yes, thank you. Take that kit back. <laughs> no, thank you very much. No, thank you very much. So it's hard for me to say that, but. You know, I suppose they're an East London club and I can just about get away with it that way. But I don't like Claret and Blue, bruv. Don't like any of them. Ricky, we've got one more question, but I think you should Go grab your charger because I think this will take a little Go bit on. of time. Um, for, those of you who, for those of you who are watching on YouTube at the moment, um, I don't think Ricky will mind at all. If you'd like to ask Ricky a question after he's asked uh, answered my question 20, um, please do put it in the comments section now and we will get through as many as we can. But the last question for you, Ricky, Go on. is, I've got to see your face for this one. All right, wait, I'm coming back. Goodness. The, the Watford story. What's it all about? <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. All right, fine. The Watford story. So, so talk okay. us through this picture. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Fine. Um, okay. Oh man. Listen, so all of the games that I go to are at home. All right. So every game that I've been to, every game that I go to has been at home. I haven't, you know, luckily or unfortunately, I haven't been able to do an away game as yet. <laughs> so, um, when I saw the text, which was, Rick, do you want to come to Watford? I saw it and I was like, yeah, all right, fine. Now, it, the, the way that you wrote it as well. I'm getting the blame. It, well, no, 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 no. You wrote it right. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. You wrote it right. You, you, put, you put Watford at home. You, you put Watford versus Tottenham, right? Yeah. So you wrote it right as well. But I've just seen Tottenham. I'm like straight away, home of football. I know where I'm going. It's on the first of January, so that's gonna be, you know, after New Year's Eve. So I went out New Year's Eve, had a couple of bottles, do you know what I mean? I had a good time. I've got nothing to worry about because why? Because I know where I'm going tomorrow. I know the route, I know what train I'm catching, I know what time I'm catching it, I know what's happening. So no worries, no worries. So even like even when I was it, just before New Year's Eve, I've I've checked it even a couple of times. I'm like, all right, cool. And I've read it. Yeah, yeah, what for Tottenham? Okay, great. <clears throat> so New Year's Eve, done New Year's Eve, had a drink, got back at like three, four in the morning, woken up, it might have been later, woken up, um, good to go, like no hangover, no nothing, fresh as a day, you get up, I'm ready to go, it's, it's, it's game time, right, let's start the year right, jump in the shower, sort my life out, jump on the train, I'm going, uh, jumped on the cent central line to, where did I go, Liverpool Street, so as I've got to Liverpool Street now, I'm looking round, and I wanted to be there a little bit early so that I could, you know, see you, have a drink, have a little chat or whatever. So I've got to Liverpool Street now and I don't see any Tottenham fans whatsoever, right? And I'm like, well, that's weird. What's this about? Like, am I here just early? Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you'd normally see a couple. You'd normally see, you'd normally see a groups of a couple or you'd see a couple looking up at the, 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 the platform, you know, the, the, what is it? Departure times and stuff like that for the train. You'd see them. You'd see them. I'm like, I can't see none of them here. I'm like, what's going on? I, saw, I just saw a few darting around the corner, but all right, fine. I've seen one or two, right? And at the same time, I thought to myself, well, where are the Watford fans? All right? I, I would normally see, you know, the, 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 the yellow tops of the Watford. I'd normally see them. 
all right, look, don't worry. What time's the train, right? Having a look, what time's the train? Seeing what time the train is. Now, the trains are coming every half an hour, which, again, is a bit weird going from Liverpool Street. Because on a match day, they're a little bit quicker. They might be like 10 minutes, 15 minutes sometimes for the White Hart Lane train. So I'm like, all right, fine. So I've spoken to my dad, right? At that time, I've spoken to my dad because I wanted to meet you early. So I, I phoned my dad. I'm like, dad, I'm going to Tottenham. I'm going to go watch the game today. He's like, oh, wicked, son. Happy New Year. I'm like, yeah, wicked. Um, I said, look, is there another train that I can get? Because I know he knows the other way, whether that be the Bruce Grove or the Seven Sisters way. I know he knows that way. But I just know, get to White Hart Lane, go around the corner, and it's there, right? So he's like, look, son, don't worry about that, the other train. He goes, just jump on the White Hart Lane, lane train. Just do, just do what you know. So I'm like, all right, I'm fine. So I've spoken to me dad. He hasn't said anything about it. No. No red flags, nothing's been flagged up at all. Jump on the train, as I'm going down there, now I'm reading bits in the paper, I'm reading Tottenham bits in the paper, as I normally would, checking bits on my phone, and I'm looking down the platform and stuff like that, you know, um, on, on the carriage, and again, I can't see too many fans, right, at all, right? I don't know, what, have I just caught an early train, or what? what's going on? Now, at the same time, I think the Gooners had a, an afternoon, lunchtime kickoff that day, so it gets to, I, I don't even know where, but I see a load of Guna fans get on to go where the, they were going. Their game must have finished at that point. So I'm like, all right, cool. Again, can't see nothing. Get to White Hart Lane Station, come out, go around the corner. Now, I love this bit. I love going around that corner and, and then the stadium just appearing out of nowhere like a big spaceship. I love it. I loved it yeah. when it was old school White Hart Lane and I love it even more now. Do you know what I mean? And I just love that corner. I just love going around that corner and it just appearing to me. So there's me by myself. Come out the station, not seeing too many fans at all. I'm like, well, okay. I, 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 at this point, I look at, the, I look at the text and I looked at the text. I'm like, are we playing today? So I look at the text. It's like Watford versus Tottenham. We're playing today. Still not clocking whatsoever. I'm like, let me check Sky Sports. Check Sky Sports, Watford versus Tottenham. We are playing today. We are playing today. So I carry on walking towards the stadium. Walking towards the stadium, I'm looking. I'm like, is it shut? Like, all the lights are off. Like, I'm like, what, what is this? Like, what's going on? And I was like, all right, cool. You know what? Maybe I'm just super early. Maybe I've just, I've, I've not even clocked the time. Maybe it's a 4.30 kickoff or something. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. But I'm like, all right, cool. So I've texted you anyway. I'm like, all right, um, I'm here. I said, um, I think you was still on your way. You were still traveling at that point. And so I said, all right, cool. I'm going to go into the club shop. I'm going to mill about in there for a little bit. And I'll see you in a minute. Gone into the club shop. There's a couple of fans in there. Again, not too many, though. Not as many on a match day. So there's a couple of fans in there. So I'm potting around. I pick up a few knickknacks. I've still got a few knickknacks of yours, Chris, that I got you at that time, just to say, oh, thanks, mate. It's still in the drawer over there. And um, so I've gone round, and then I've, as I've gone to pay, one of the security have stopped me, uh, a security lady, and she's like, oh, was you in the Princess Switch film, the Christmas film? And I was like, yeah. So they was like, oh, awesome. I just watched that with my kids at, at Christmas. We loved it. Really nice to see you. There was like the two girls behind the counter, they recognize you from EastEnders. So I was like, oh, how are you doing, ladies? You're right. So then they started chuck they, they started chuckling and we started having a little bit of a conversation. So I was answering their answering their questions. I get a phone call from you and you're like, Rick, where are you? I'm saying, I'm in the shop, I'm in the shop. Give me two minutes, I'll be out in a minute. It's like, all right, and cool. Put the phone down, finish off the conversation. Nice one, ladies. Lovely seeing you. Come on, you Spurs. I'll see you soon. Happy New Year. Walk out of the stadium, look across the road to where I think. You're, you're gonna be and like there's literally nobody there i'm like what what's what's happening like where is everybody so then i give you a call i'm like chris where are you mate he's like yeah i'm just down the road from the club shop like vicarage road club shop and i was like oh nice all right well i can't say i said wait what did you say he's like yeah i'm just down the, down the road from the shop vicarage road so i said vicarage road he said yeah i said bruv i've only gone to white art lane and you're like, nah, you, you, I think you genuinely believed that I was joking. And I'm like, I Chris, I'm not joking. I, I'm like, mate, I'm not joking, bruv. I'm, I'm literally, I've just, I've just come out of the club shop, bruv. And I'm looking for you and you're nowhere to be seen. But yet, is that Vicarage Lane? I'm like, oh my 
god she was like no nah, don't do it to me i was like all right and cool let me try and get there let me try and get there as as i'm walking back towards white art lane station i'm there trying to work out a route train route on my phone i've worked it out i get to white art lane but as i get there a train's left and i've got 30 minutes to wait until the next train which just yeah. would have wiped me out. So I, 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 that's where that picture comes from. Me outside White Art Lane with the bloody world face mask. That's where that picture comes from, with me being like, I can't even believe that I'm here. Didn't know you was going to chuck it on the internet, Chris. <laughs> Sorry about and then, that. It's fine. And then everybody texts me. I've, I've had Anthony Costa text me. I've had Darren text me. I've had everyone like, where are you? What are you doing? They were getting me left, right and centre. And then I'm on the platform waiting. It's like even the half an hour train was delayed by another five, ten minutes. I was like, ah, oh, do me a favor. And then I kind of sulked home um, and got home, I think, for maybe the last half an hour of the second half. Even the missus, she was like, babe, what are you doing back? I said, babe, I'll tell you in a minute. I'll tell you in a minute. I'll tell you in a minute. I'm just going to watch the end of this and then I'll tell you in a minute. But yeah, that was a Watford game. I don't know, mate. I don't know. I just went to the home of football and that was Tottenham Watford. So I, I went to Tottenham. You missed a 1-0 win. You missed a Davinson Sanchez goal. I mean, come on. I mean, I, and, and I missed my first away game. Would have been yeah. with, with yourself and Putsy and stuff. That would have been great. But hey-ho, what can we do? We've got the story, haven't we? So. Ricky, I hope you don't mind. Um, some of the viewers have uh, sent in some questions for you. Um, right. What do you think of Eric Dyer? What do I think of Eric Dyer? I think... I think... He's not as bad as everybody says, in the sense of, before I start, in the sense of, in the sense of, um, I liked that he came from Portugal. I liked, I liked the fact that he had a footballing brain. When he first came into Tottenham, he came in and the one thing that he wanted to do was change the kind of soft underbelly. He didn't like the word Spursy. Um, he came in and he wanted to change that. And when he came in, he played right back, you know, centre midfield, DM, and I, I thought we, we, we was on to a winner with Dyer. Um, then his time in midfield, as he, he had a couple of injuries, and I think one of them was an appendix as well. Um, and he just was getting slower and slower, and it was easy to pass him, easy to turn him. And I started getting a bit fed up with him. I, I, I thought when he first came in that he would be um, a Tottenham captain at one point. Uh, because of the way that he started. Um, but then those times in midfield and he was just getting past and it was like, it was, it was like we didn't even have a midfield when he, when he was there sometimes. And that started to grate on me a little bit. And then I was over it, um, you know, and then Mourinho's come in, put him in centre of defence. And I'm like, I don't know. And there was some good performances, but mostly bad performances. Under Conte, I'm not, you notice how I miss Nuno, but under Conte, um, I thought I, I felt we we started to see what Dyer could be uh, as a defender. It wasn't fully formed, but I felt that he, he could be. You could see there there was potential for him to grow into a to a, a leading centre back. But now it's it's tough because I just I, 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 I it's it's tough it's tough. I, I, I don't think he's the number one centre back there. I don't think I think he could be a squad player now, um, because I know a lot of the players respect him. I know he's 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 good for integration as well. When we get players from the Spanish league or the Portuguese league, he, he does kind of help with the language to be able to speak to them and settle them in and stuff like that and be that type of communication barrier, um or communication bridge between the players on the field as well. So uh I, I think his time is probably done, um, if not a squad player. But it's it's tough to say because I really did like Dyer and I, I backed him for a really, really long time. Um, so, yeah, I, I probably think now his time is probably done um, and I, I'm ready for a number one centre-back. I'm ready for somebody who is, is bona fide, you know, 100% centre-back that can do the job and uh, do it well and, and pro progress that way. Um, so, yeah, it, it, there's been too many performances now where I just look at Dyer and I'm like, 
it's not the one right now. It's not the one. It's not the one. But he, 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 for, for, for me, and the reason that I say he's not as bad as people say when I first started that that thing is because he, he does remind me a bit of Delhi, you know, in the sense of when he came in, potential, um, wanting to do for the club, what, you know, loving the club, wanting to put everything out there on the field, wanting to go through the bad times to try and get through to the good times. And and whether you like it or not, he's still the best centre centre back that we've got at the club. You know, we've seen that centre centre back role with Davison Sanchez, and you know, I think that time is is long gone. Um, we've seen it with Longley, and I don't think that kind of works. I prefer him on the left. Um, I don't think Tanganga is a centre centre back. So he's still probably the best centre-back at the club uh, to play in that central role. Um, and I, I, you see it when he's not there as well. But I, I, I don't think he is the number one. I am ready to see somebody else in that role um, and somebody whose job it is to be a defender. You're so polite, Rick. Such, such, such a <laughs> lovely guy. So, so politely put. Um, I, I love my put- team, brother. I love my team. Sorry. He writes here, can I buy you and Chris lunch at Smith's in Onga? <laughs> got, got to be a couple of steaks. Yeah. I mean, it does, that, does he mean the steakhouse or does he mean WH Smith's? Because, uh, again, I don't deal. want to get lost. <laughs> it's a meal deal, Rick. It's a meal deal. Oh, can, mate. Well, thank you for your kindness, mate. Thank you for your kindness. Can we trust you on the train? <laughs> yeah, listen, when I, when I 100% know where I'm going... Then it's fine. I know where I'm going. All right. It was just I just got confused. I just I just heard Tottenham, saw Tottenham, and I just couldn't work out that there was somewhere else that you could play, uh, that Tottenham could play that wasn't White Hart Lane. That's that's all. Rick, this is a good question. Um, what is your favourite Spurs shirt of all time? Um, it's got to be the Holston era because I grew up with that era. Uh, Holston Adidas. When we were sponsored by Adidas, uh, the navy Holston, the three stripes, even the uh, training gear, I loved uh, of that. Um, but yeah, some dynamite players was in that shirt as well. Ginola was in that shirt. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say. I can't remember what year it was, but sponsored by Adidas and we, we had uh, the Holston sp- sponsor on the front. I think we know your love for Ginola by now. Um, Nagelsmann or Pochettino? I know you're a big fan of Poch, but what do you think of Nagelsmann? I think Nagelsmann is a dynamite um, coach and I think there's so much more to come from him. I think that he could build a a really good squad and I think it could be exciting. But he is my number two choice. You know, if we don't get Poch, then that's when I want Nagelsmann. Um, It's just that I I just got this feeling that I don't want Nagelsmann to come in again and kind of play like he's doing us a favour or or have to convince him that Tottenham's the right place for him. Um, you, you're not going to get that with Poch. And with all the problems that we've got, we need somebody who can unify the fans, the club, the squad, um, you know, and, and get everybody not only behind the team, but that team playing for one another and, and, and loving one another again and, and having that yeah. brotherly spirit you know, having that Spartan spirit where it doesn't matter what happens, nobody's going to get past us because I've got your back to the left and I've got your back to the right. And uh, I just miss that family feel. I miss that class. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think Poch loves us and I think that he would go beyond the line to to, to fix us. Um, I think he, even though he wouldn't like it, he would accept the way that the club operate in the transfer market. And with the signings and with our youth as well, with those youth sides, we've, you, you go and watch the youth, Chris, and you know we've got some dynamite youngsters that are in that in those younger squads. And who better to kind of bring them through and nurture and, and kind of learn from than Pochettino? Well, we're meeting up next week and going to the Manchester, Manchester United home game. Um, yeah. Will you be singing Pochettino's name? Loud, mate. Loud. As I come out of the station and I do that little corner, I'll be singing it from then, my friend. That's when I'll be... You'll hear me before I get there, let me tell you. It's not an away game, is it? That's definitely a home game. 
That's definitely a home game. Um, Rick, la last two questions for you, because there, there are an awful lot, but last couple for you. Um, what positives could there be if we let Harry Kane go? Maybe style of play? I don't know, mate. Uh, I don't know whether a style of play is, is one of the positives. Um, I think that's got to do with the manager and the philosophy that comes in with that manager. Um, the only positive that I can kind of see if Kane goes would be an influx of money. And But then what worries me is how we use that money because we're, we're not good at replacing good players that we've had at the side. We could go through it. Dembele, Ericsson, Rose, Walker, Ledley, Toby, Yan. You know, yeah. we, we could go through, we, we could go on forever. And that's what worries me. When, when Kane's time is done, or let's say if he goes this summer, I don't know where we're going to be as a side because he is a Tottenham boy. He's another one that bleeds blue and white. He's been for us, with us through thick and thin. And again, the, the, the one of the things that he would love to do, that I believe he wants to do more than anything, is win a trophy with Tottenham to go up those stairs and, and with a cockerel on your chest and lift that trophy for Tottenham, for all of us fans. And I think that, I think he's going to be a glaring miss. I, I, I think those that take him for granted and say that he can't do something, I think he's always proven that wrong. You know, if you say you can't do something, then Kane has always proven that wrong. But I think there's going to just be a glaring gap there, mate. And um, I think it's going to be a tough time when, when he does eventually go. Kiefer said that Smiths do do steaks, Rick, so it's good news. Um, Excellent. <laughs> Ed writes here, if you could pick an acting role, what character would you play? And Johnny writes here, um, who would you rather play in a movie? Christian Gross or Nuno Spirito? <laughs> <laughs> These oh, are better than my goodness. questions. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I think, do you know what? Uh, for the for, uh, the manager one, I think it would have to be Gross, you know. Just because, can you imagine the 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 kind of build up to me getting on a train, train like being yeah, giving me train ticket from Levy and then having me train ticket on the way out, you know, and all the the debacle that happened under under his uh, management uh, time. I uh, I think that would be fun to play, and uh, you know, with Nuno, uh, you can't get a film out of Nuno. He only had what ten games, so I think it'd be done by like half an hour you wouldn't even get a netflix episode out of me you know so yeah probably gross on that one and um if i could play any role mm, i'd love to play a detective i'd love to play uh, not so much uh, I, I would say columbo do you know what i mean but i know that ain't a, a, a movie role with some murders it's somebody somebody with that with with that eye, do you know what I mean? Somebody that, who went in and kind of, you know, the one thing that was great about uh, Colombo is the full sense of security that he put the murderer in. So every time that he went into a room and he would know that this is the guy, but he would play stupid, he would play dumb, he would knock things over, he would ask silly questions. And then, that, and then just as he's finished frustrating you and getting the answers and, and seeing the body language and knowing that you're the guy, just as he left, he just, oh, one more thing, and give you with that killer question. Do you know what I mean? And I, I think Columbo was absolutely fantastic. So if I could play a, a, a detective, that would be amazing in a film. Ricky, I can't believe that we've been talking for nearly an hour and a half. I've absolutely loved this, and I've learned a lot about you as well. Um, I could have probably asked you 120 questions, not 20. Um, and I know that a lot of people have uh, loved asking you questions as well. It's been an absolute pleasure having you back. Um, and I think that we should do this again. When you're ready, mate. When you're ready. It, I'm just happy and honoured again that I was the first one to do the, the, the whole new concept of the Chris Cowley Talk Spurs. But we're talking about everything else. And uh, yeah, so honoured and, uh, honor and, and, and it, it's been a pleasure to be on. And I always knew that we were going to do more than 20 minutes. I knew that. I, kn I knew that it was, I know me and, and the fans know how I ran already, how I tell a story. So I knew it hit this time. But um, no, honestly, it's been so much fun. And, and thank you again. Thank you for having me on. And thank you uh, for asking some great questions and letting the fans out there know a bit more about me, which I had no clue what you're going to ask, but it's been uh, uh, loads of fun my friend Ricky what are you up to at the moment and uh, where can people find you on social media 
Well, on, on the socials, you can find me on Twitter at Ricky J Norwood, which is just down here. Um, on Insta, it's official Ricky Norwood. There ain't no blue tick on the Instagram. Don't ask me why. I'm trying to get it sorted, but yeah, it's not there as yet. Um, and then what am I up to? I've just done a couple of lovely auditions, so I will let you know. But um, in the meantime, I am reading about directing. So I'm studying on directing and the director's eye at the moment. And I'm also into the gym. I've never really been a gym guy. Um, I've worked out at home and I've gone to classes and stuff like that, but I've never been a fully fledged gym goer with a gym membership pass. But right now I am. And, and, and that is great to kind of, it's great for your mental health. It's, it's great for frustration. And it's great to put kind of unused energy into something that's positive and get something out of it. And it's really nice to kind of, I've got into that zone now where it's gone past the first week where it's like, uh, going gym. But I've got to get into that zone now where I'm really kind of enjoying the idea of just being kind of, just, just investing in me um, and kind of, Try, try, trying to be better, trying to look better, trying to be prepared for the next role so that when it comes, you know, I'm, I'm ready for it. So that's that, that's what I've been up to at the moment. And, you know, I'll, I'll be on with you probably the weekend, chatting about well, Spurs and have my head in my hands. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Well, you're always looking great, Rick, and it's always great having you here. Um, oh, thank you, mate. Thank you so much for uh, coming on, Rick. And uh, thank you so much for listening and watching, everybody. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do hit that subscribe button, like, share, and comment below. And if you are listening to this on an audio platform, please do hit that follow button and leave a review if you can. I'll see you again very soon. Until then, come on, you Spurs. Come on! Come on!